yeah, so welcome fifth uh, Teach Climate Network um, book club and discussion group. Um, so we'll discuss drawdown and some hope and solutions uh, this week. Um, if you didn't come last week, it was it was a doozy. <laughs> uh, but it was good. I'm about halfway through Water Knife right now, Betsy. So uh, All right. it's a lot darker than I thought it was going to be. I mean, I knew, but wow. Yeah, yeah. A, a little violent too. Mm -hmm. But really well done. Um, so yeah, initial thoughts uh, about the book, um, things that you really liked or focused on. Um, I'm sure nobody read it cover to cover, but <laughs> I did. I read it cover to cover. Oh, oh, wow. It was their Christmas gift. She right. had <laughs> it was way more fun than the other stuff I was supposed to be doing. <laughs> it is good. No, seriously, I I I read it on airplanes this month, and nice. um, it was the most hopeful thing I've read in a long time. Which I needed that, so mm -hmm. I've already recommended it to some other people that have been down the dark rabbit hole and needed a bright spot too. And I said, look, we, we have options. We can do this. And I kept thinking, who are the philanthropists that will step up and help make this a reality? Yeah. Yeah. But I, uh, it also occurred to me that I didn't know of many of these options. Oh, me neither. Yeah. So, yeah. I liked, um, like the whole refrigerant management thing yes, yes. is really amazing to me. And I, I know one of the professors that works here at the university, it's a chemi professor. Um, he's been doing research for a long time about like all the alternatives that they had for CFCs and how they were even more potent greenhouse gases. But <laughs> so that's good that, um, you know, if we can, uh, get something new coming because you know living in air conditioning country here in Arizona um, people are always having to recharge um, air conditioners and stuff yeah and then there if, if I went on the website one day because I wanted to direct my teachers to this positive side too and they have ranked the solutions and that was a good uh, visual mm -hmm. yeah. I shared it with my teachers and uh, the tropical forests are just one up from educating girls and that was surprising to me because to me the time time frame for both of those are is, is they're huge different you know educating girls seems to be much of a time in, intensive initiative than tropical forests but it's right close right there right there so that was yeah. it was just really fascinating to see you know even like the top 10 and how incredibly different they all were uh -huh. um, mm -hmm. as a vegetarian i focus a lot on food mm -hmm. you know, shopping local and in bulk and things so number three and four reducing food waste and a plant-based diet those are things that really don't cost us anything which I yeah. thought was really interesting. Um, you know, obviously it's a societal shift which can sometimes be harder than investing um, in new technologies, but those were, were interesting reads. Um, yeah, the, uh, I mean, a lot of the food related things with reducing mm -hmm. the waste and eating local we've been doing, but my husband's our main chef and he's a meat eater and I've n I could go either way, but morally there's a lot of reasons to, get rid of meat or really reduce it right and of course when i'm on my own i get to but the book introduced a couple new concepts about was it meatless monday and um meat free before five or whatever that is yep yeah that was a new one to me i hadn't heard that one yet yeah and i those are concepts that are it's so much easier to think that way it's mm -hmm. like let's just i mean we do eat meatless some days right but not in a conscious way mm -hmm. and meet, meatless monday and meat free before five are just things that i can share around easily with people that have no desire to think about going vegetarian or vegan but they want to do lots of little things to be less impacty on the planet it's like well here's a way to remember a few things you know right. throw that into the mix right mm -hmm. and it's it's so easy um, when you look at it from, you know, like a cost saving side of things, like so many people, when you start talking about environmental solutions, 
that all they are listened to is dollars saved. Hey, Sarah. Hey, Sarah. Hey. Hi, Sarah. I'm Wendy. Uh, hi. <laughs> Uh, Wendy first joined us last week, and Sarah, I think you were the first three. Yeah, the first three. Yep. Calls. So this is kind of our core group right here. Mm-hmm. Good to have you all with us tonight. Um, so yeah, we're just kind of discussing our favorite parts. I know Sarah had an email, and you hadn't um, been able to read the book yet, but um, we're just kind of discussing some of our favorite parts and, and some of the stuff that we like. Um, do you kind of know a, a little bit about the book at all, Sarah? Yes, I do. And I actually had our librarian check it out for me. So I have it. I just yeah, no haven't had a chance to read through it. I'll say Betsy was the only one that read our book last week. So <laughs> that was including me. So no. hey, there's one person every week. Wendy is there this week. So there we go. So. Yep. <laughs> um, I, I want to say that um, pa- page 155 about telepresence. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I read the. the, I just, you know, I put. If you see my little book here, Mm. little little (laughs) lots of pages, but um, that was the one that I thought was the most immediately relevant to my life, to Mm -hmm. to my staff and my whole company. Just about, look, we're not. We can do. We can not just justify. We can support this, and it lines up with everything we believe in, rather than thinking of it a burden or an obstacle or a privilege or. Let's just label it for what it is and it, as a smart choice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's give yeah. people the tools they need always. Because like a lot of my staff don't have the right computer to make this easy and, you know, whatever. They've got an old bulky desktop at work and then they have to have a personal computer down, blah, blah, blah. So I, I thought I labeled telepresence as just a no-brainer from where I sit at work in terms of pushing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I read through it in, um, like I did the, I started reading it page by page and then I, oh man, I I don't have enough time. So I just went through the top 15 and then I started picking ones that I wanted to read. And there is a lot out there that we're doing right now with our no environmental literacy grant because we're going to be doing rainwater harvesting and we make all our teachers eat vegetarian, local all the time in the workshops. <laughs> and we, um, you know, and, and some of the principles of rainwater harvesting, um, we teach them about permaculture. And there was so much of that in there with, um, you know, um, like the, um, what was it the, uh, oh, not aquaculture, it was, um, I can't remember the term, but basically where you're you're not tilling the soil over and over and you're letting things decompose to help provide the garden more nutrients. And that's what we do all the time in our rain. You know. No till agriculture. What was it called? It's no till ag no till ag practices. Yeah, yeah. So there is a lot of that stuff in there that I I got super excited about because we're preaching that and we're working with that through our grant. And so then I went on the website, and the website has a whole lot of great information, and I think I can share it with my teachers without them even having the book. And one of the things on the website talked about how Paul Hawkins was going to be in these different locations, and then the senior writer is actually going to be on campus here the day that we're doing a teacher workshop like oh, later awesome. in the afternoon. Wow. So I'm hoping to convince everyone else that, hey, we should take our teachers over there for the last hour of the workshop and listen to this person talk. So hopefully that'll work out. So would that be a win-win for the book club? Because you're dipping in the professional realm now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I liked it. And one of the most interesting ones that I found where they have a, identified a seaweed that has some uh, that impacts the gut flora, and that helps the, um, the cows in 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 their fatulence. And oh then, yeah, yeah, I read that part. Yes, that was like because methane secretions are coming from the cows, and I was like, somebody already looked into that. I mean, yeah, I, and they get they get fatter because they have better digestion and they absorb their calories better. I didn't know that. Why don't we talk about these things when we when we teach climate 
and everything and temperature. Well, as, as the book says, it is the most comprehensive. So, you know, it's all in one place. I mean, I've heard about bits and pieces of these, but seeing it all together made it so much more hopeful and doable. And I mean, if I was either an activist, which I am in my own way, right? But I mean, if I was looking for the shopping list of things to do, or if I was a philanthropist looking to invest in the future, this book is just like, just go through and go, bing, bang, bing, bang, <laughs> you know, go right through it. No, I think I'm thinking from curriculum design perspective, because I am in the process of working through lessons. And, and I think this should be a part of it. It's, and for, for my purpose, we have a core, um, eight lessons that are the content but they should be a part of the core lessons because it's so positive everything that we have put in the core lessons right now is conceptually you have to think through it and then you get depressed yeah. <laughs> I think including it in curriculum is a brilliant idea yeah so. yeah because well one of the things they said by the end of 2017 they hope to have all the models up and at your fingertips so that you can do the math yourself and so that intrigued me because we're always getting trying to get students and teachers to do more math so that's when i went out to the website and it's not up there yet but it is a question i will ask that author if i get to go see it <laughs> once it comes The, uh, the page that depressed me the very most was page 179. It was talking about the oceans. And, you know, every, throughout the book, there were occasional paragraphs that were just downers that described the realities of where we are now in very concrete ways, even though the book as a whole was hopeful. But 179 was just so depressing to me about the state of the oceans and the way they went on and on describing it. I just... I just wanted to hang my hat up as a human and say, I should have turned in my card and I shouldn't have been allowed to live on the planet. Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's depressing. We were, uh, I was on the clean call yesterday uh, at, at 12 and one of their new ESIP fellows um, has done some work with uh, basically ocean cleanup. And he ended up working for an organization in Alaska I think called washed ashore. And he, they would clean up beaches and then end up doing art projects with a lot of the waste just to bring attention to the problem. And I thought he had said like 75 to 80% of all the stuff that they find either, you know, in the water or, or on the beaches was land-based stuff, you know, versus yeah. fishing material that just, you know, nets and things or like spills off of ships, you know. I don't know how often you guys get to go to the beach, but I, I went to Hawaii when I was a little girl, Oahu, and then I went back a few years ago. Mm. And what I remember as a little girl is when you walk the beach, there was a little tiny line of maybe seaweed, the occasional share where you could tell where the high tide was, just a little natural marker of various little oceanic debris. And now there is so much plastic in the ocean that every high tide is marked by a line of plastic bits. Mm, I went uh, yeah. snorkeling in Jamaica, uh, not Jamaica, Puerto Rico, uh, a year and a half ago. And I got so angry as we were snorkeling because all that I could see was plastic bags. Ugh. There was so much plastic in that area of the ocean. Oh. It was awful i was like i have to get out like i i can't even do this, this isn't even joyful oh. <laughs> so depressing i know we did a um, national geographic um governor teacher trip and um we were way up in the arctic and uh, even finding plastic and stuff on these remote beaches it was crazy yeah that was my least favorite page although again by the time it got through the dark paragraphs it talked about the good news and the hope and the opportunity. So, um, I like the one. Um, I think it's page one eighteen. The man who stopped the desert. And oh, it was that's so, a great story. Yeah, and um, mm -hmm. where was he in Africa? I'm trying to remember, but they were going through all this drought, and people were leaving, and, and they they ended up um, 
they they would do like basically rainwater harvesting around their plants or they would dig a hole and then he started putting manure in it and then it started growing these trees and it ended up just being a really positive story it was it was cool since that's where we're headed drought and drought i think there was a tv or some um series about there was a npr or somewhere there was a video that i saw of this person he, he's, he lives by himself and he planted so many trees and the the irrigation has improved in the area and he's specifically planting a certain kind of tree that mm -hmm. it's i can't remember but it's either i can't remember but it was on tv some night so but sounds familiar to me yeah that was cool did anyone else read the one under coming attractions near the end about repopulating the mammoth sea? Yeah, I read that. That was really interesting. Because that, yeah, that's a great one blew one. my mind more than anything else in the whole book. Right. I'd like to see some more ideas behind that because you know it, that's one of the big um, tipping points is all the permafrost melting and and releasing the methane. It and, is, and it sounds. I mean, the personal dedication to testing this in the test place and seeing that it works reintroducing large mammals into permafrost areas and then the entire science of the healthy outcomes that actually save the permafrost it's it's mind-blowing yeah. <laughs> yeah. can you give me a summary i want to know i didn't read this um well i mean in essence that's it he uh, there was a whole theory about what happened and that the large mammals were hunted out of extinction. Oh, say so which way is it, Betsy? Yeah, they did hunt them, you know, enough that they, yeah, to ex a lot of them were to extinction in those areas. And, um, and so uh, what happened is that all the grasses, it says they went away. And so you just have this frozen ground with no kind of um, vegetation or anything on it. So that what they're talking about doing is bringing them back and creating like this kind of tundra cover. You know, but, I'm not quite sure how it's all going to work. Well, I mean, and the thing is, he's been testing it and he's already imported large mammals on a test plot and mm -hmm. watched it work. But he changed the whole theory of how the ecosystem crashed and proved it with his science. Instead of, let me find the right phrase. If, if you have the book handy, mm -hmm. it's pages um, 172. That's where it starts. And let me see if I can find the key phrase. Well, the, the writers of the book say, if this comes to pass, this would be the single largest solution or potential solution of the 100 described in this book. Wow. <laughs> so, so that, um, so this guy's dedication, walking the land, he became convinced that the theory of extinction was back. <laughs> And he said that the at the end of the ice, ice age, 13,000 years ago, <laughs> spread across that area. And within a short time, 50 species of large mammals were hunted to extinction. But he said it was obvious to him that the mammoth and um, lar the large animals were died first. And that no one could test his theory, but he's retested it on a plot of land. And he shows why it works to reintroduce them and make the permafrost healthy again. Interesting. I'm going to have to definitely read that one. <laughs> yeah, it's mind-blowing. It, it was the one that I was like, well, let's just skip the other 99 to start with. <laughs> right. <laughs> Everybody work on that money one. now. <laughs> Oh, fascinating. Uh, I have a question. I have a couple questions uh, more related to teaching 
um, and using this in the classroom. Um, so I guess, how would you do that? How would you incorporate this um, into a science classroom? Or actually, we'll start with that. Let's start with science classroom. <laughs> I was thinking that having gone through this thinking through lessons and getting them in the classroom, I feel the need of application scenarios at the end. So right now our lessons, because we are, we're, the curriculum is model based, students use the global climate model and they go through the model and they, they're assessing um, they're assessing a phenomena, phenomena of temperature increase. That's what they're doing through these eight lessons. But at, towards the end, I want them to connect this into a human impact and then that solution scenario. So the only thing that had come to my mind and I tried to write it out was from an engineering design perspective. Like how would you design so we've talked about increasing temperatures, then we have correlated it with carbon dioxide, then they have correlated it with other things. So then I created a scenario, well, how would you design something that would, you know, take the carbon dioxide out of this system? So sink and, uh, sink and uh, system and sink approach kind of thing. But that's the best I could come up with. And I, now I think that there could be other ways to give them some of these scenarios and then they could brainstorm, add further. I don't know. But this didn't come to me when I, you know, I was working through them in fall. So I don't know. I think giving them the positive scenarios here's something that has been done and now now think of some other design solutions that could be uh, created i don't know that's what i was thinking yeah and betsy's cool. conversation about using the ability to do the math yourself when that comes online on the website really would facilitate mm -hmm. that process mm -hmm. Yeah, I like the idea of using engineering design kind of thing and working it that way. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. it would be interesting to see how to do that. I haven't thought about it in that much detail. Mm -hmm. There. Um, the other thing, you know, I was thinking of and, and I'll, a question that I have, especially with all the different agriculture practices, where they talk about inter like the silvo pasture and all the stuff where they're interspersing trees in there. I don't like so much of our farms are automated today, and I don't know how that works in harvesting things. And it would be interesting to um, learn more about that and how how they're actually doing yeah. a large-scale farm that way. I'll say that that particular example would have to be something smaller. Um, we did a documentary a couple of years ago with our local PBS station, and mm -hmm. one of the segments of that was on silvopasture and how this particular farmer in, in central Minnesota was raising cattle and then planting trees um, around the alfalfa or whatever he was growing mm -hmm. as a solution to climate change. Yeah. Yeah, and then they talk about it too, like planting, like instead of the traditional rows, just planting a mixture of different things and mm -hmm. how healthier it is. But then, you know, it's not really set up for massive harvesting of stuff and, you know, with all the equipment. And uh, I'm wondering, um, you know, having, you could actually have problems for students to kind of figure that out. How would you harvest that or, you know, how would you plant that? Because I know especially in the West with planting, my cousins are, are farmers and stuff and they, um, they have like such high tech equipment now to just get your rows exactly right and, you know, use the least amount of water possible and, you know, that's where it's all going. So it should be. You know, a lot of questions I still have, I think, with egg stuff. Well, that's interesting because um, it kind of gets me to my second question or second part of my question about teaching this, this using this book. Um, we've mentioned math and we've mentioned agriculture. 
So how would you use this book in a classroom besides science? Mm. So what other thing, what other ways could you get this into art or into social studies? Um, yeah, I think there's English. a lot of the social justice stuff in there, especially with the women and girls, that you could bring it into other areas. Um, what about policy? You know, all these, some of the practices that you had mentioned before, the no-till act, you know, they have been around, but not all farmers adapt them just because you don't feel they feel they'll lose some subsidy or some policy they don't need it. so policies need to be changed hand in hand as these solutions come up front or, or are available i don't think and, and business courses yeah so yes. many of the things that are in there are mm -hmm. counterintuitive to what a whole generation or two of people have been raised to think as good business. Yeah. And yet when people run the experiment and are extremely dedicated, they turn the whole idea on, on its ear and show people that in fact, it's not what you would expect is maximizing profits. It's the exact opposite. And it seems like this book, you know, each example, they've done the homework to mm -hmm. clearly justify at least the first case of the business case for, for the activity and the cost benefit analysis. And it's so different than what so many people were taught. And so bringing that into a business class early on and just teaching a whole generation of people to think, don't, don't take what we've done for the last hundred years as your assumption of what is success in business. Think about these approaches. Yeah, no, that's a that's a brilliant idea. Um, one thing that, and this is this is so strange because I I hate to admit anywhere that my mother was right, but I am admitting. <laughs> we'll ever. keep this one offline. <laughs> yeah, but she well, in our town in India, the, the you still go for groceries with that you know your own bags and you get stuff. They will measure it for you and you you have to take your containers and they put it in your containers. And then uh, for me growing up and, and my dad and even my mom, like hygiene is the biggest issue. And then the containers have to be prepped before you go for your grocery run every 15 days. And then she would stand there and was like, no, you know, checking on people who are putting stuff in her in her containers. And then she came here and she, you know, even now in our town, everything is in packaged and the double package and apples have their own little isolated packing and all that. And she was saying that all this costs money and, and then where does that money come from? <laughs> so I was like, I don't know, but I see what she's trying to ask. Like, am I paying extra for these apples to be packed this way? Or, or wh why can't I just grab my apples in my bag <laughs> like I am used to? So she was raising all these questions. And, and whenever, whenever she'd go with me, she'd say, well, you know, we could bring our own things. So the, would, would they still charge us like sales tax? I'm like, yes, they would. <laughs> <laughs> so she was she's a teacher and so those things and then I noticed some a few months ago there are some stores in Europe somewhere where you can go get your own stuff and then in our Whole Foods here some of the stuff you can just go use your own containers and get it but we we can't we should be able to think about this in a bigger scale mm -hmm. But we're not doing those changes. We're, yeah. we're not. We're not. Because food comes from so far away that it has to be packaged a certain way. It yeah. I think that just as a society, we are a throwaway society. We're a single-use society. Things need to be easy. Things need to be minute-made. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge shift, you know, in our culture that needs to happen. I mean, personally, me, I have my box of mason jars and my bag of bags that I bring to the co-op. I have a box for my produce that I, you know, buy. So I am try as zero waste as possible. The bulk aisle is my best 
friend at the co-op. So yeah, I, your mother I, would I, love you. I totally <laughs> relate to your mom. <laughs> and I think, you know, a lot of that goes back to, and I, I saw that theme a lot throughout the book is that what was old is new again, yeah. you know, because yeah. like my mom's generation grew up in the depression. And so, you know, they recycled everything, <laughs> you know, and, um, you know, and then, I, you know, they talked about, um, you know, just a lot of the farming practices and old practices. And last weekend I had the opportunity to go up to Northern Arizona and we were, you know, hiking through um, ruins of Walnut Canyon and, you know, and how they had, you know, where they did their farming and how they got access to their water and how they grew these things that they could do. And so all those ideas are starting to come back because they were sustainable and, and you can do that. And so I think it's a lot of, that's where you can bring in other, like you talked about teaching in other areas. So you talk about history and, and the history of what was done locally in your area. And, you know, why did we move away from that? Or how do we move back to some of that, you know, that was sustainable when they didn't have a faucet they could turn on water or they didn't have a grocery store they could run to. Somewhere in between being completely disposable society, which is the worst of our practices and being able to be as dedicated as shopping at the co-op with your own supplies, there is, I think, a lesson we can work with students or our own, you know, communities and friends and families <coughs> is, is social pressure on our retailers Definitely. to minimize their packaging and my biggest experience with that myself is a long time Costco customer. Like as long as Costco, Costco has existed, we've been customers there. And I have seen through the years them continue to be responsive to customer feedback that we want less packaging. And they, you can see them constantly, they screw up routinely. Like something comes in and it's hyper over packaged, but you can see them make changes and you even see them admitting to making those changes based on customer pressures in their own um, monthly magazines. So mm -hmm. there's a lot we can do as consumers to exercise our power as consumers to change what was being served up to us. Definitely. The gas stations have now oranges that are peeled up but are in a plastic <laughs> and I'm like you know if you were to keep an orange you couldn't peel your orange yourself why do you have <laughs> easy, Gabby, easy 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 but it's it's just awful. No, it had a container <laughs> it's ridiculous I know yep it was like the uh I think I heard on wait wait don't tell me they talked about this guy that got this Amazon package that was packaged up like this giant box and inside a box and what he ordered was bubble wrap. <laughs> it's like, Absolutely ridiculous. Uh, I ordered a TV several years ago and got it in the package. I don't even know what the company is and opened the box and you would expect it to be in styrofoam two big old pieces of styrofoam and I opened the box and what was in there was kind of T-shaped um, cardboard pieces. That yeah, I've packaging. seen those and, and some triangular ones. Yeah, and yeah. Was it, they're the coolest thing. And so I took a picture of it, went to Twitter. I was like, great. Thank you company for getting rid of styrofoam, you know? So it's praising when the good stuff happens and then pushing when you're upset. I would, took a picture down the paper plate aisle at Target a couple weeks ago and put that on Twitter. Like one container of paper plates in like an aisle was compostable or, or messaged as compostable. It's like, nope, nope, this is not okay, Target. No. I know what was sad was um, at the Grand Canyon this weekend, um, we were in the cafeteria and some lady mm -hmm. in line was looking for a water bottle and the national parks went away you know especially the grand canyon no plastic water bottles yeah. and the lady that was working at the uh, register goes oh well we're gonna have them back because the trump administration said it's okay to have plastic water bottles. Oh, yep. like, no because you know we're constantly cleaning things up on the trails <laughs> it's so nice not have to worry about all those plastic water bottles even my sister who came with me and uses a plastic water bottle all the time brought a reusable one <laughs> so. yeah it's 
incredibly unfortunate. Yeah. But again, so, I mean, if, if the government's not going to be there for us, then like you said, Wendy, we have to push, you know, companies and organizations to make sure that they're doing as best they can. Some positive changes do happen and, and they, people see, and then the other people speak up. So mm -hmm. Uh, my little town in Waconia, where, where I live, we didn't have a farmer's market, but the town right next had a farmer's market. And I was fine, like, you know, many of us were fine going over there, but the the city council decided that we want our own farmer's market, which was great, but they wouldn't have wanted it at the other city didn't have there. Right. So, so you know, you see, and then they do. So now we have a little farmer's market, and it's very, very nice, you know. Mm -hmm. you, you buy less, and then you go, you know, and you, all you need is a week's supply. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't mm -hmm. need a freezer. <laughs> right. <laughs> awesome. Any other ideas? I, I have said that I want to share that um, I, I have a very thoughtful, powerful in his own way colleague who writes a very informed blog called Living in the Real World. Okay. And it's all about sustainability from the point of the meteorology community and what we have to contribute to society. Um, he is the associate executive director of the American Meteorological Society. And he's also the senior policy fellow of the program. And he's been running a program for nearly 20 years to introduce people in the atmospheric science um, field to the world of policy so that we can be more effective working in areas of policy. And so he writes this blog and so he's just incredibly insightful and thoughtful and an excellent writer. And so many of his blogs for years have been about we really have to affect the change with all the pressures on the planet and i recommend i asked him yesterday if he'd read the book and he had not so he'll be reading the book and mm -hmm. i told him that by reading this book i really thought that i saw many future columns in the blog because with it being a science oriented blog even though it's open <coughs> to anyone just the factual information and the way in the book I think will spur many potential future blog postings so if you want to oh. see how book club impacted me impacted him impacted blogs he writes which lots of people read drawdown might appear in his blogs in the future <laughs> that's awesome I, I would paste the URL in here but I don't see a place for me to share but if you just google living in the real world yeah that, his name is Bill Hook and um, he writes a very thoughtful blog. Great. Yeah, we'll look that up. Thank you, Wendy. Oh, thank you. I wouldn't have read Drawdown if it weren't for this group. So. <laughs> is the next book this happy? What? Is our next book happy? Uh, Same Sun Here is what it's called. Uh, it's a young adult fiction. It is, I'd call it somewhere in the middle. <laughs> Okay. Uh, okay. It's a pen pal style book um, between a boy that lives in Kentucky and his community is going through uh, mountaintop removal and wow. a girl that lives in New York from India and mm -hmm. they become pen pals through school and write about their experiences as middle school students. It's very um, now, <laughs> even though it was written several years ago. Um, just based on the experiences of those two students and how real they are with each other. Mm -hmm. That was a really, really great book. Um, and yeah, that'll be next week's book. I'm not going to share my screen with y'all, but I just wanted to point out March, we're going to do Flight Behavior from Barbara Kingsolver. Um, maybe a book that some of you have read. I have not. Um, mm -hmm. It's one of Kristen's favorite, so she yes, it is a good book. That's how I figured out that she was doing a book club with the Clean Net friends long oh, sure. time ago. Mm -hmm. because they were discussing uh, flight behavior, and I'm like, "Well, this book club needs to include me." <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm excited to read that one. And then April, um, I actually just chose a children's book. 
um, or an illustrated um, book, I guess. Uh, it's called Buried Sunlight, How Fossil Fuels Have Changed the Earth. Um, and it's just, it's a children's book because it's, you know, it's a hardcover, mostly pictures, but it's a really good interpretation of fossil fuels and how and why we've used them. Um, and both that book and Same Sun Here are two books that we recommended and included in the curriculum that we wrote for a school in Washington, D.C. that we've worked with. They transformed their sixth grade curriculum to be climate change centric. So those were two books that they uh, incorporated into that. So awesome. um, Minds in elementary and then on top of it, climate literacy. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. So those are February, March, April. Everything's on the website, on the Teach Climate website, um, books and, and things. So you can feel free to check that out. If anyone is interested in blogging about Same Sun here, I'll send you a copy of the book. Um, otherwise, I will put it out to the rest of the rest of the group. Um, because there's a lot of interest in the book club, and I don't know if people are watching it after the fact, which would be great too. Um, but join us. It's super fun. I'm going to give a pitch to our um, Minnesota Earth Science Teacher Association group about <gasps> being a part of this. Since That's Climate Generation is going to be our key speaker here in a couple weeks I'm so at our conference. I'm so going or involved with it. Yeah, yeah. I'm one of the board members. <laughs> oh my God. Is there yeah. a website? For your art science teachers. Yes, there is. Um, can I can I get it, please? Um, I don't know it off the top of my I'll head, but you could just Mesta. Google. Yeah, Mesta. Mesta. What? M e s t a. Okay, that was one of like my favorite conferences when I was teaching. Yeah, it's a super fun one. Yeah, Kristen's doing the keynote for that this year. So. Yes, I have, I have bad news about book club for the coming months. Since you were organized enough to tell us all the dates, I've checked them all and I can't make any of them. Ooh. I know I love getting together with you already. I'm two months in and I'm addicted, but I can't make <laughs> So I'm going to have to just like read the emails or follow back with the chat or look for the recordings or. Yeah, I send out the recordings after the fact, um, usually a couple days after. It takes me a little bit to, to put that together. Um, and then if you're not a part of the Facebook group, um, there is a Teach Climate Facebook group where I'll post things and there can you know, be much more discussion on that if you're interested. I um, can't remember. I'm going to go look right now and see if I already found that or not. I think I did, but I'm going to go to the link. I just threw the link in the chat um, for the Facebook group. I just have to okay you um, to get in but yeah that's a, a nice place Where to is the chat that's oh there it is there it is i could have put the link in the real world link there do you want me to paste Betsy, it in or did you already Betsy did it i, I pasted oh, it in. already there oh. <laughs> i couldn't find the chat it's been a long week month year <laughs> i was gonna say last week's going faster than or this week went faster than last week but yeah i feel yeah winter's getting to me <laughs> We don't have had any. I would say, I'm sure you're from the <laughs> <laughs> Even the Grand Canyon had no, no ice on the trail. It's the first time I've been there in wow. the winter with no ice on the trail. Hey, I get my little dose of sunshine next week. I'm coming down to Phoenix. My cousin's getting married. So oh, okay, very cool. excited. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully it'll be nice and not hot. I'd be fine with either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I say you were talking about Walnut Canyon and the Grand Canyon. These are all my stomping grounds. It made me feel yeah. homesick to my youth. <laughs> well, awesome. Anything else? Um, Thank you. No, oh, no we end with our teachers and any new ideas we come up with. So. Is someone blogging this book or? Um, I'll write one. No one has said it that they'd want to, if anybody does. When well, I could, I want to write one. So I can do this one. I Are can you sure? Do, yes, I'm sure. Okay. Otherwise, I'll be on a plane next week, so I can do it then. <laughs> you want to do it or, or I'm doing it? I'm fine either way. If you want to do it, it's all yours. Okay, I will right. do it. Yes, it's a young children's book. I like it. And then, of course, there's someone from India, and that has to be my cousin. I'll do it. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you. I'll send you a book. Okay. Send me the book. Fabulous. Okay. Uh, email me your address. 
you could drive down. It's just six hours. <laughs> okay, what are you going to be in Waconia next? That's that's a little easier. <laughs> next 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 week, the week after. Oh, right, we'll see about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send you the Minnesota address. Okay. Yeah, so it'll it'll be there sooner, and I'll get it. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, ladies. This is always yeah. a joy. Hey. Good night, ladies. Bye. Bye. Good night. Bye. Bye.